we're going to do, Nikki, uh, in a couple of minutes, I'm just going to uh, uh, put some questions for you to, to uh, if you don't mind me, just to give some insight into our guest this morning. Uh, Nikki, from your perspective, how is the SA economy faring and uh, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, you know, the, the most amazing thing about South Africa is that at one point last year, it looked incredibly scary. Um, and, you know, it looked like it was possibly a game over type scenario. Uh, and we also saw that everybody just assumed we won't recover. And I, if I say everybody, I mean international investors, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. They had a horrendous forecast for South Africa out there, minus, you know, eight, minus nine. The worst I saw in the market was something like minus 15%. Uh, but then as they started lifting uh, lockdown restrictions, and literally all the damage was done under alert level five. The moment they started moving from to level four, level three, level two, what we saw is that the economy bounced back very quickly and a lot stronger, I think, than a lot of people expected. It's still weak, make no mistake. Level five lockdown inflicted a huge amount of pain to this economy, but we did stage a recovery just like the rest of the world. <clears throat> you know, you often hear this is a W shape. Is it a V shape? It's very much looking like a V shape. We are moving uh, forward. And then in the early part of this year, uh, when we had the second wave, we returned to adjusted level three lockdown. There was some concern. Um, there was the expectation that the economy might enter a double dip type recession. Uh, and the reality is that that actually hasn't happened. We haven't got the first quarter economic growth or GDP numbers yet. But we do know from the monthly statistics that South Africans proved to be quite resilient uh, to level three lockdown. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Government firstly have learned some lessons from level five lockdown. They have become a lot smarter in the way they implement um, these restrictive measures. Uh, they're more targeted, um, and therefore they are less destructive to the economy. So that's the first good thing, I think, that uh, emerged in the early part of this year. The second good thing is that South Africa's population um, has definitely been remarkably compliant. Uh, you think of the fact that in urban areas, many South Africans, uh, we are a poor nation, we live on top of each other, and yet um, we are all acting very responsibly. And that's why we have not been one of the super spreader nations. South Africans have been, generally speaking, very compliant. The other thing I think that protected us in the early part of the year is that companies have become smart. They've They've adapted. Um, they proved to very, be very flexible. They've used uh, technology um, in order to continue to sell their goods, um, produce their goods, um, and to continue to operate as a business. And often, um, in the process, reporting efficiency gains. So because of this incredible adaptability, I think that also limited the damage. And so what we've seen, in fact, in the first quarter, instead of the economy um, falling, we saw weakish January, and then we saw activity pick up quite significantly. Um, we now have a situation where, for example, wholesale, retail sales, that is back to the levels of production we saw in 2019. So in other words, they fully recovered from the shock of lockdown. Uh, vehicle sales, for example, is now back. Um, it's not only um, recovered from the shock of lockdown, they've actually reported some growth. And I'm talking now only of new vehicle sales. The only industries that we still see are struggling are things like restaurants, hotels, um, B&Bs, uh, you know, guest houses, all of that kind of activity, obviously because of the nature of this crisis being a virus and therefore your contact intensive industries tend to be a lot more vulnerable. Um, they are still operating well below 2019 levels, so at about 75% of 2019's level. And then, of course, accommodation, all ranges of accommodation, that's about 30% of last year's level. So that gives you an indication of where we are. So last year we contracted by 7%, and it looks like we are on course this year uh, to grow at a rate of somewhere between 3.8 and slightly over 4%. But it could be stronger because, as I said, South Africans have learned lessons, uh, government has learned lessons, the private 
to be very adaptable and very smart in the way they deal with lockdown and restrictions. And the South African society at large have been very compliant. And the outcome of that has simply been, I guess we've had two waves, but they don't look anything like what we've seen in places like the UK, even Germany, France, and obviously nothing near what we've seen in the United States and in India and in Brazil. So we have protected us to some extent. We preserved our economy. Um, and we are growing again. That's the good news. So I actually think at the end of the day, we could have a situation where this economy actually expands this year by about 4.5% instead of the 3.8% which everybody is expecting. So it's not easy, but um, we are recovering. And that's the good news along with the rest of the world. Um, and certainly we proved far more resilient than I think anybody expected from us. Great, and Nikki, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and Nikki, and which which sectors are, are kind of standing out doing well? Well, it's definitely mining. Mining has actually been driving this recovery. So we're seeing that mining is now um, at up 103 percent. You know, so they they basically 100 point 103 percent of 2019's level of output. So they're showing actual growth. 2020 has been fully uh, recovered. Uh, all of those losses have been fully recouped and they are now operating pretty much under normal circumstances. So what we're seeing driving the mining sector has of course been a very strong global rebound. Now that global rebound uh, was not accidental. Let me make that very clear. I think it's been a function of a couple of things. The first one being uh, the, the absolute remarkable work done by the medical profession and um, pharmaceutical companies and bringing us a vaccine in such a record space of time. And not just one, but quite a couple of them. Um, so that's the first thing that's been fueling global activity. We know in some advanced countries they've been rolling out vaccines very rapidly. The UK is pretty much near herd immunity. Israel, every, every adult above a certain age has been inoculated. Um, and the US have played dramatic catch up um, and they should achieve herd immunity very soon, very definitely around June, uh, July, August this year. And as a result of that, they're opening up. And um, as they're opening up, you've got that whole balance, that normalization in economic activity. And then there's China. And of course, China, there's a lot of irony here, um, is the only country last year that managed to grow. The only country in the world that actually recorded growth. China's very important to us. That's where all our mining exports go to. They've been growing very rapidly. Um, and so that has resulted in very robust demand. And more recently, we've also seen um, that governments have supported the world economy in a very dramatic way. We've had incredible fiscal stimulation coming from advanced countries. We have also have um, plans to continue with that fiscal stimulation. And here's the important bit. You look at Joe Biden, he recently announced his American jobs plan, and a big portion of that is infrastructure spending. So on roads and rail, air transportation, and then also the transition um, to a green economy, uh, to green energy, to green buildings. Um, and we are talking about trillions of US dollars, two trillion US dollars to be exact. Uh, you've got a similar situation in the EU, you've got a similar situation in the UK, where they're actually focusing a lot of their spending in the years ahead on infrastructure. Now, infrastructure consumes commodities. That means there's going to be medium-term demand for commodities. We've seen commodity prices rise, and that's been very good for our mining industry and our mining exports. So that's been the key driver that has stood out. And also all your retailers. And here again, it is goods producers and, and, and wholesalers and retailers of goods have generally done really well. Services, it's been a little bit of a different story. But of goods, it's been accepted. So that's the one, the other area that stands out very clearly. And then, you know, finally, I think um, we also have a situation in South Africa where all our professional services, um, they can quite easily work um, on a digital platform, is also done quite well. Uh, so those are the industries that stand out. Um, I think that South Africa still has tremendous potential in terms of hospitality, uh, whether it be restaurants, catering, all the way through to tourism. Um, so we need to protect and preserve it. It's not going to grow under these circumstances, and not until COVID has been 
defeated everywhere in the world, and all some other vaccine vaccine related passport um, mechanism has been established, but that will allow international tourists to return. But we do need to protect it, and we cannot let companies go down there. Uh, but the industries that have been formed has been manufacturers, goods and uh, retailers, and, and wholesalers of goods, and then of course it's the mining. Over to you, Mark. Great, thank you for that, uh, Nikki. And and importantly, where where is the local uh, economy heading? Well, like I said, I think we're going to recover. Um, last year we contracted by seven percent. Uh, this year, the, the market consensus is for, uh, is for the economy to grow by about 3.8%, um, and then to maintain growth of around 2% in 2022, 2023, um, and down to around 1.7% in 2024. So that is looking a lot more hopeful. Just like the rest of the world, we are on an upward trajectory. The evidence of that is very clear. It's there in the actual data. We'll be looking at retail sales, wholesale sales, vehicle sales, mining or manufacturing production. It actually shows that V-shaped recovery is very well established. And like we said, we think it could actually be even stronger than everybody's anticipated. Uh, we think we might actually even clock growth of over 4% this year. So that's the good news. We are recovering. There are things that are holding us back, and a lot of them predate COVID-19. It predates the lockdown. And one of them obviously is the fact that um, we still have a situation where we have an energy shortage. Um, businesses still have to contend. Businesses and households have to contend with power outages. So that's the one big problem we have. The other problem we have is we still have a state um, that is dealing with a legacy of over a decade of corruption, of inefficiency, um, and of poor policy choices. And uh, the outcome of that has been a massive debt burden, um, a huge budget deficit. And uh, that means the government's ability to support the economy is fairly minimal. Um, so I think that those are the two things that will continue to hold us back, is our inadequate infrastructure, particularly electricity infrastructure, and then, of course, the fact that government is not in a position to accelerate spending. In fact, they have to do the opposite. They have to cut spending um, and uh, in order to reduce the deficit and to slowly stabilize South Africa's debt burden, which is unfortunately uh, now over 80% of GDP and is projected to climb to close to 100% of GDP. So it's completely unsustainable. Um, so those are where the drags will come from. And if it wasn't for those factors, I think South Africa would have been able to plot much better growth. Thank you, Nikki. And, and, and Nikki, what will drive economic activity in, in the years ahead? Okay, so in the short term, it's definitely going to be the world economy. If um, Joe Biden and uh, China and the EU and the UK and Australia, if all of them manage to get their infrastructure drives going, and we see this massive surge in infrastructure spending, then um, clearly there's a good future for mining over the medium term as well. And then I think the consumer is quite resilient. Uh, we saw a huge amount of job losses last year, but we started to create employment again from the second half of last year. So we're seeing employment tick up. We're seeing people um, earning a little bit more income. Um, we also see a much more responsible consumer that have emerged from um, the lockdown crisis. Uh, on, on average, consumers have been very conservative in their spending. Uh, they've put more money away uh, for uh, a rainy day during the course of last year, and they kept that pattern up seemingly in the first half, first um, sorry, the first three months of this year. And, and and what it means is that South African households have become net savers. So there is this this build up of savings that once confidence improves, once we we certain um, as individuals that COVID is under wraps, and there and we can see the future. It is very possible that all of that pent up saving will translate or tr be transferred back into spending. So there could be a bit of a spending bounce over the next three years as well. So in that sort of consumer, consumer demand um, uh, sector, there is some promise. Um, and then finally, I think uh, the reality is that uh, if you're a wholesaler, the future also looks fairly good for you because companies, of course, run down their inventories during COVID. 
and they're still trying to get rid of old stock. Um, and inventories are at record lows. So at some point, they're going to have to replenish those, uh, those inventories. And when they do so, demand uh, will pick up as well quite dramatically. So I think those will be the key drivers in the short term. Um, and the longer term, of course, there are no quick fixes. Uh, the only way that company, uh, countries get richer and their citizens get richer is by producing more and producing it more efficiently. So productivity growth is the key driver of long-term economic growth and long-term economic prosperity. And for South Africa to fix that, we will need to fix our energy um, crisis. We need to resolve that. We will need to deal with inefficient infrastructure. The state will have to be fixed in a very big way. Um, they will have to make better policy choices. They will have to get better at implementing those policies, which is another big problem we have in South Africa. And then finally, um, we will have to deal with our long-term issues like education, 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 put the infrastructure in place, make sure it reaches everybody, um, and you know, uplift the skills levels in South Africa so that South Africans are generally more employable. Um, so I think in the long term, We've got major challenges, but in the short term, things are definitely looking a little rosier. Great for that, Nikki. Yeah. And, and importantly, uh, what is happening to the RAND and uh, where, where is the RAND going? Okay, so the RAND's been remarkably strong. I mean, um, we've seen it uh, go over 19 to the US dollar in April last year, and we said then it will come back. There was a lot of um, controversy about that. The RAND always does that. It overshoots on the way um, up, but it overshoots on the way down, and it overshoots on the way up. So it's a highly liquid currency. There's a lot of speculation in the currency, and as a result of that, it is incredibly volatile. So I've got to put a disclaimer here. Whenever you talk about the RAND, the only thing that can statistically be proven about the RAND is that it's unforecastable, right? So this is how volatile the RAND is. Because of all of the liquidity in that market, and also because of the fact that it is, um, you know, it is often seen as almost a benchmark for emerging market currencies. So the RAND has recovered very nicely. Um, initially, all of that really uh, was an emerging market wave. What we saw in the United States, and remember the U.S. is actually, as far as monetary policy is concerned, the most important country in the world. The reason for that being that they are the preservers of the world's reserve currency. All right, so everything is measured against dollars. Right, so that's what it comes down to. Commodity prices are quoted in dollars. Uh, foreign reserves are mostly held in US dollars. So because of that, the US matters tremendously. And what they did in the heart of the crisis and the heart of the lockdown is they slashed interest rates to 0.25%. And they started printing money, and I mean printing money at on mass, right? So they've been pumping dollars into the system on a daily basis, truckloads of them. Um, and as a result of that, the dollar started to weaken. And as the dollar weakened, all emerging market currencies, including the rand, strengthened against the US dollar. What is interesting in the beginning of this year is because your advanced countries, well, they're wealthy and they can therefore afford to support their economies more than emerging markets countries can. Um, investors have been flocking back to advanced countries, especially to their equity markets. As you've seen, things like Tesla, um, like Amazon, like Netflix, just soaring um, to what you have to say is starting to look like very lofty heights and hugely overvalued. But the bottom line is there was a return to advanced countries. So many emerging market currencies actually in the early part of this year, in the first four months of this year, were under pressure. The exception was the RAND. The RAND actually strengthened further. And um, it's a bit of a mystery. We don't know why. We do know that foreigners have been returning to the South African bond market. We know that they've been buying bonds again. So there's a capital inflow. And whenever there's a capital inflow, of course, they're selling dollars, they're buying RANDs. So the RAND tends to strengthen. So we know there's been an element of that. Um, but I think the biggest reason is a massive trade surplus. Because our imports have collapsed due to weak demand, and because exports have soared due to strong demand for commodities and rising commodity prices, underlying trade flows are such that it's supporting the currency. And um, also, we're hearing a lot from investors 
that South Africa is kind of like a tranquil spot in your emerging markets. You get good returns because our interest rates are a lot higher than U.S. interest rates. Um, and you don't carry all the risk that you would if you went to, say, a Brazil or an Argentina or a Chile. Um, and as a result of that, uh, I think the RAND has done quite, quite well. The RAND, by the way, now is fairly valued, if not slightly overvalued. So that makes it very tricky predicting where the RAND's going to go, right? Because it's already fairly valued. But given the dynamics globally, that for your low-risk countries, your returns is an impotence, okay? Interest rates are exceptionally low. And um, we offer a positive yield to investors. That's the one thing. The other thing is our market is highly liquid, so investors are never going to get stuck in South African assets and, and be unable to sell it like you might in a Russia, right? So that means that also benefits the RAND. And so given that global environment and given the positive story behind commodities specifically, I think the RAND will probably hold value this year. I don't think it's going to get a huge amount stronger. It's probably going to gyrate somewhere between 14 to 15 to US dollar, and that's where it will settle this year. Then from next year onwards, I think the dynamic will change. I think markets will start to anticipate that at some point or the other, the advanced countries will have to start taking all that money they're printing and all that liquidity they're injecting. And they'll start to anticipate that at some point or the other, and your low-risk countries, interest rates will go up. And I think then you're going to see more two-way flow, and under those circumstances from 2022 onwards, the RAND will probably start to weaken. So you might ask me, Mike, well, what are we saying in terms of specifics? Well, we expect the RAND to average this year 14 months money in the US dollar, and then to weaken to 1527 to the US dollar on average next year. So that puts it into some kind of perspective for you. So that's it. Great, Nikki. And uh, another important question we have is that um, what is likely to happen to interest rates and why? Okay. So interest rates. Right. So let's let's just set the scene for everybody on the line. How does this work? Okay. So we've had interest rates cut with prime now being at a 55-year low. Right? So that's been nice. We all like that. We all like a, a low interest rate. But what drove it? So the Reserve Bank sets the base lending rate, the repo rate, okay? Then banks slam a margin on that. That repo rate is the average cost of funding uh, for the banking sector. They put a margin on it and they lend out that money um, to borrowers in, uh, in, the, in South Africa and in, in the South African economy, households and corporates. All right, so that's how it works. But how does the Reserve Bank determine what interest rates should be? Now, in South Africa, we've got a system called inflation targeting. All right. Um, the official inflation target is essentially uh, three to six percent. So it was it is the job of the South African Reserve Bank and their monetary policy committee to keep inflation between three and six percent. That's their job. Now let me firstly say they've done an excellent job. When um, Governor Kahiaru took over, he said, "Well, hang on, it's very difficult to target inflation at a range of between three and six percent." And, and it kind of doesn't make sense. Three percent, think of it as a highway or a road. Um, your, your edge to the road, your yellow line, that's kind of your three percent. And your middle line is your six percent. That's where you put your life in even greater danger, right? And why would you want to be, be, be concerned with these two outer bounds? What you really should be doing is targeting and steering your vehicle on the middle of the road, right? On the middle of your lane. And so since he took over, he said, no, our target is 4.5%, the midpoint of that target range. And we're targeting 4.5%. And the incredible thing is that they've managed to get inflation to those sorts of levels. Um, in March, inflation was 3.2%. So it's actually even below their target at this point. For out last year, it was below their target. So they target 4.5%. At the moment, inflation is very low. But a lot of that had to do with the fact that demand collapsed. Companies sat with a huge amount of stock. And the only way they could get rid of it was to discount, right? And that brought inflation down. But that was an extraordinary type of situation. Now, as the economy normalizes, companies are going to try and restore their margins. And as they do that, inflation will start to tick up. Added to that, we've seen global fuel prices 
normalize. I think yesterday Brent crude was trading at $68 uh, a barrel. So that's hovering around that sort of between $65, $68 a barrel. But in percentage terms from last year, it's a big increase. It's it's 35% up, all right? And that's going to slowly work itself into South Africa's inflation rate. So inflation is going to go up. The question is how much is it going to go up? So how this works, if, if the Reserve Bank believes over the next three years, based on their forecast, of all things like how strong will demand be, what will be the rate of pass-through from companies to consumers, what will happen to the RAND, what will happen to oil prices, food prices, they build this all to, into a model. And if this model tells them that inflation is going to be rising over 4.5%, what they will be doing is saying, okay, well, then we need to hike interest rates in order to counter that. So that's how it works. And we need to hike them today. Okay, So at the moment, it is important to bear in mind that the model does actually reflect that inflation will rise over 4.5% this year. It's not going to run away by any means. It's not going to come near to the upper limit of the Reserve Bank's target range, which is 6%. But it is going to start rising. Okay. And it's going to go over that 4.5%. So in theory, they should be thinking about hiking rates. And that's exactly what their model suggests. Their model suggests that they hike rates 25 basis points in May, another 25 basis points in the final quarter of this year, which will be November. And then next year, it suggests that they hike rates by 95 basis points, so just less, just short of a percent. And then in the year thereafter, by 1.12%. Right, which is 2023. So interest rates would then be normalizing, returning to the levels that prevailed prior to uh, the pandemic striking this country and prior to lockdown being imposed. Um, however, we don't think they're going to follow the model. And the reason for that is South Africa has been through a big shock. Uh, we didn't contract as much as people thought we would, but we still contracted by 7% last year. Uh, we still saw a situation where a lot of people left, lost their jobs. Many of those people have not been reemployed. We are recovering, but you'd really like to see the pace of that recovery accelerate. Um, and so, frankly, I think the Reserve Bank would make a mistake if they actually did hike come May. Um, I think they should give the economy a little bit of time to heal. They should give the economy a little bit of time to gain momentum. Um, and I don't think it's going to threaten the inflation forecast or the inflation outlook in any uh, a big way. Um, and they should deal with the interest rates next year. That's our view. So our view is that rates stay flat this year, and then it goes up 100 basis points. Um, what is it now? Prime is 7, so it goes to 8%. And then we see it flat at 8% um, for another two years before it starts to move higher again. So worst case, you're going to have 8% or 9%. So that's what you can keep, kind of keep in your mind. If, if the Reserve Bank follows their model, they'll get you to about 9% um, over the next four, to, uh, four years. If they don't, and it looks a little bit more like we're predicting, then the worst case is 8%. So that's what you, businesses can sort of calculate in their head. Yes, Mike, that's it. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. You know, it's been quite a challenging period over the past year for, for many SMEs, of course, uh, uh, and, and, and for many others, it's been quite prosperous. We know that. But uh, these external factors don't help much. And an important question from Small Business South Africa is, is how long uh, will the electricity crisis uh, persist? Unfortunately, OK, let, let's get the positive here. Under Andre de Ruyter, things have improved, all right? And unfortunately, because he's doing his job, he has made some enemies, right? As you know, there's this case against him, accusations of racism. Um, it's coming from the procurement officer of ESCOM, so you can imagine that it might not be as valid uh, as suggested, but of course, they're going to investigate it. If there is racism, they need to act on it. Um, but in terms of doing his job, he has done it, and he is doing it. Um, and things that is called, is moving forward. There has been progress. But the problem is that the mess is enormous, and a lot of the mess is unfortunately structural. Okay, So like a Madupi and Kassili, they are structurally flawed. So now you've got to invent ways of fixing it, invent ways of making sure that this power plant can at least operate close to some level of efficiency. And 
it's never going to be a highly efficient form of energy. They know that, and Andre de Rater have said as much. So it's going to take time. It is definitely going to take time uh, to fix this problem, and that's what they've been putting out there. So there's a very high risk of continued um, uh, of continued load shedding. Uh, it's going to be worse between now and September. Um, by the time we get to September, we are going to see renewable energy that was part of the fifth bit, the fifth round of uh, renewable energy bits come on stream. Um, sorry, the fourth that will come on stream. Um, and as that come um, comes on stream, it will relieve some of the pressure on the but not all of it. And I think what we're looking at is we're probably going to be living with persistent power outages. Um, although the frequency and the scope of it will diminish as the system is going to get its together. Um, and then, um, but we do think it's going to be with us for another three years. Okay. Great stuff. Thank you for that. Nikki, I have one final question for you, and an extremely important question. Uh, what needs to be done to place South Africa on a stronger and sustainable growth path? To some extent, I've answered that question. You often hear in the news people saying South Africa has to undergo structural change, right? And, and what do they really mean by structural change? It's almost meaningless. No one knows what that means. Well, what it really means is resolve your energy prices, get sufficient ener energy capacity online, and very importantly, lower the cost of energy. Now, it's not just about building power plants. It's about making sure that ultimately they run efficiently and it lowers the cost of electricity. Lower the cost of production in the economy overall. Improve all your infrastructure, being road, rail, port infrastructure, um, and bring the cost of it all down. Not just put the infrastructure in place and uh, charge people a fortune for it, but bring the cost of operating in South Africa down. That will help small businesses. It will also help entrepreneurs, because if it's not so expensive to start a business, you'd be inclined to do so. The other thing would be, of course, solve the education issue. Um, find a way to re-educate those who are unemployed, um, to ban them literally with marketable skills or some kind of marketable trade. They're never going to be professors or engineers or IT engineers, but there might be a way in which you um, can give them a skill that they can go out there and market and sell and make a living from. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, address inequality. And the way you address inequality is by making sure it's a living playing field, by doing all the things we've just mentioned. Lower the cost of production, lower, remove entries to uh, barriers to entry, encourage entrepreneurship, and very importantly, make sure you fix education. We know education is the biggest reason why people fall behind and why inequalities grow. Um, and uh, so the, that is what they mean by structural change. And then the last thing they mean by structural change is government needs to fix its finances. All right. So unfortunately, government has to spend less than they get in a tax revenue. It's as simple, that, simple as that. They've got to try and run a budget surplus at the end of the day so they can use that money to dump it in their debt and bring their overall debt burden down. So that is what South Africa needs to get onto a stronger growth footing is these sorts of structural changes. Nikki Weimar, uh, economist of uh, NetBank, thank you for your insights. You know, it's always important for SMEs to understand uh, and, and, and bring them into their thinking for the future. We're very grateful to have had you on board. But it gives me the chance to give you some insight uh, into some of the most recent findings coming out globally. Uh, and why, why are the most mega, the biggest mega entrepreneurs of the world running the biggest companies in the world are doubling their turnover every year? Now, here are some insights that you can bring into your business if you haven't already. Um, just to give you an idea, when you are seeking new staff to join your business, do you go on skills or values? The world's most successful companies only recruit on values. They are not recruiting on capabilities and skills. The overwhelming consensus is that skills can be taught quickly to the right people, but in most cases you cannot teach attitude or values. And these are the kind of highlights that they look for in the top 15 of the most successful companies in the past two years. They look at these values when recruiting staff or converting their existing staff into adhering to this. 
And here we go, take some notes. I've also written an article about this. Are you committed to your own personal growth? Powered for self-achievement, high energy, enthusiastic and positive, internally motivated, results and solutions orientated, competitive nature with own self, prepared to do whatever it takes to get things done and treat all tasks with urgency and the person who has the ability to pivot, change direction and see things differently. Now, if you look at the most successful companies, this is what they are looking for in people and their existing team is all about doubling their turnover year on year. But to add to that, number two is that it's common knowledge amongst the very serious, not only on corporates, but seasoned businesses. Everyone at that level who are running businesses or running mega organizations around the world, sales is the oxygen of every successful business. Don't turn off the oxygen. If you do, your business will die. Sales is everything. If you have an abundance of sales, cash will flow, and if cash flows, you can fix everything. They talk about the rainmaker concept. You have to be every business owner or a head of a mega organization has to be this has to be the primary rainmaker in that business. The person to go out there and find big customers, do big things, and grow top line quickly. So that must be in the mind of every business owner and entrepreneur is to focus on, of course, top line growth. And here's another key one coming out. If you want to live an easy life, do the hard things, work hard and solve big problems. If you choose to live a hard life, do the easy things and solve small problems. And then finally, if we can model the success traits of the zero to hero mega entrepreneurs, there is no doubt that we will experience fewer difficulties and fewer failures, and that our road to entrepreneurial success will be shorter. And so these are the five key things coming up because people often say, you can't speed up success. You have to be patient. But what's very important about that, although patience is a necessity, we can speed up the process of success. And no problem, and you gave me a chance to, to release some key findings coming out in the, in the last few days. Uh, what's, what's kind of common amongst the world's top entrepreneurs and how they're running their companies. Because what's amazing about it, Adam, as you know, is that more now than ever before, it's the easiest time uh, in history to start the business right now. And if you look at the most successful companies in the world, in the top 10, they're like doubling and trebling turnover every year because of the people within their business. So that's quite, it's quite interesting. But Alan, thank you very much, Alan. You've been a friend of the NSNC for many years, uh, 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 of course, with NetBank, and uh, NetBank's been a big partner of the NSBC at the forefront of doing many things for us. And uh, so we're very grateful for what we do for small business. And Alan, uh, I've known you for years and I'm very happy to have you on board and, uh, and Nikki gave us some great insight uh, into the economy and what we can expect into our electricity problems and interest and the RAND. So it was wonderful having you on board. But let's let's shift a bit of our thinking, Alan, if we can do. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can, Alan, uh, you're the executive of a small business and professional banking at NetBank and been that way for a while. And it's shifting towards small business, specifically small business. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from the floor here. How should small business owners think differently around how they sustain and grow their business in the current tough economic climate? Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, and again, I, I don't profess to be a expert on how small businesses can, can go about fueling their own business growth, but I can certainly provide a lens um, from, from the perspective that, that we experience small business. Um, and, and obviously, as a bank for small business, we, we get to see a lot. Uh, and of course, you know, there's no point in rehashing just the climate necessarily. I think um, that's been done adequately by, by Nikki. But I think, you know, tough economic climate combined with the coronavirus is sort of the perfect storm. Uh, we've seen small businesses actually being surprisingly resilient. We know it's, listen, we know it's not easy. We just, we've seen that, I think, through the applications that have been coming through to the banking industry with respect to the 
the government uh, COVID-19 loan scheme, albeit it's been heavily undersubscribed relative to the expectations that initially existed. Um, I think small businesses are probably sick of hearing uh, people talk to them about how they can need to go about cutting their costs because I think they're probably um, have already cut those right down to the bone. So there's probably not a lot more room um, insofar as that's concerned either. Um, and so <laughs> I won't preach that sermon, I promise. Um, I, I think where we are seeing um, businesses succeeding uh, are those businesses that have adopted technology as, as the way to go about doing their business in the future. And so, and technology from a, from a number of perspectives. In fact, I'm sure there's some followers of, of Jeff Bezos and he's never really claimed to be a technology company, um, but technology has been the enabler um, for their success. Anything what the pandemic and the circumstances have shown us is that people's behavior has changed. How people go about, and, I mean, apart from being small business owners on, owners on the line um, and as bankers, we're also all consumers. And I think if we reflect on our own behavior over the last year, it will have changed fundamentally. Um, and technology, I can certainly speak for myself, and I suggest there's a relevance for others. Um, technology has become a bigger part of our lives in the last 12 months than, than what it has in any other time of our lives. Now, that's part of the progression of technology, um, but it's also been through necessity because being able to procure certain things during certain parts of last year um, were almost only possible through means of technology. And so our sense is that the, the more people become adopters of technology um, as part of how they do business going forward, the better. It's gonna make them more efficient. It's gonna make their products and services potentially a lot more convenient to access for the prospective clients. It's never too late to get into this game. Um, I guess a number of the people on the line may have heard of a Chinese proverb which says, when's the best time to to, to start planting a forest? Well, the answer to that is 20 years ago, and when's the next best time? And that's now. And so I would urge um, entrepreneurs that if they haven't gone through a process of adapting to the technology that's available, that they don't waste any more time and they do exactly that, because you run the risk of making yourself irrelevant if you don't, because others will embrace the technology and that's going to potentially end up pushing you out the market if you don't. And it's not just... Um, a small business play, it's everywhere. I mean, as a bank, we've had to really ratchet up the pace at which we roll out um, uh, certain elements of our technology. And if we don't, we've realized that it will be the end of us. There's just absolutely no question about it. So technology is is a crucial thing. We have seen, um, you know, I can't give you too many facts and figures necessarily, but there has been... Um, a growth in, for instance, people's use of their cards, the card payments through e-commerce transactions at rates at which you have never, that as a business we would love to be enjoying in terms of our own business um, growth. The rate at which people are putting cards through um, websites to pay for things has just got, been off the charts. And so that gap between swiping a device and punching in your, your details into a website um, has reduced significantly. Um, which again shows that people's buying behavior has changed to a very significant degree. As consumers, I'm not sure about you, but I don't get the same kick around going window shopping through malls anymore. I think parts of the behavior that we've seen shifting is going to have some permanent effects. And so technology for me is a, is a really crucial thing. And there's many ways you can go about doing that. I mean, there's people like, um, there's people that will host your products such as Take A Lot. Uh, in fact, Avo um, is a net bank property, and I would urge you just to go and have a look. We're inviting small businesses um, to come onto the Avo platform as a mechanism to being able to make your goods available to a broader marketplace than perhaps is, um, is available to you at the moment. And so, you know, you're going to see more and more of this type of thing happening. And uh, I think if you think hard about it, um, there's a relevance in this for pretty much every industry. Um, and one may feel that even in the business, the business space is perhaps a little less relevant. I don't believe so, but it's quite a lengthy debate. But that, that's my sense, Mark, around, you know, um, you know, where businesses need to be thinking if they haven't already started doing so. Sure. Yeah, you're a bit right, Helen. You know, I was talking to someone overseas on an online meeting the other day, 
And you know, it's quite common, you know, those big companies who never embraced technology 20 years ago are no longer here. And uh, for businesses now, if you don't understand and, under and embrace uh, remote working, you won't be around in 15 years' time. So I think the way the dynamics have changed, and I think what the pandemic has done has sped up the inevitable or what's coming, just sped up the process. But another key question coming through, in the current tough economic climate, it remains a good time to create networks, obtain learning on how, on how other operators are navigating the crisis. As a banker, do you have any tips for our audience on where to start? Um, I guess the same Chinese proverb applies here. You know, networking's have, have never been unimportant. They've always been crucial. And perhaps maybe there's an elevated level of importance now. Before I get onto that, the other thing I just want to mention, if I may, Mike, just on the previous point, is that there's continual and growing pressure on corporates to be supporting small businesses. Um, and I'm not talking as banks necessarily, I'm talking in general. Um, and the other area I would suggest small businesses uh, start understanding better. Um, and, and you will miss more times than you will hit, but if you hit, you may hit significantly, is to go into the corporate space through the internet and understand what the enterprise supplier development initiatives are in many of these corporate environments. It's very difficult and it's potentially quite a protracted process um, to get involved with corporates and their enterprise supplier development programs. Um, but it's worth the effort because when it does pay, it can pay in quite a significant way. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there as well. Um, getting back to the, the network discussion, Mark, I mean, network is a crucial thing. Yes, um, in, in thinking about that question, I sometimes wonder whether when we about networking, whether we're doing so under the auspices of trying to get as fast as possible to the person who's going to end up consuming our goods. Um, and, and I think that's certainly one way of going about it. The other way of going about it is potentially trying to network with people who share a customer segment with you, um, but supply a different type of service. So maybe by, by way of example, um, think about uh, hairdressers. Um, and think about uh, nail bars. Now, my sense is that I don't know a lot about either of them, as you can as you can see. But uh, my sense would be that they are probably trying to attract a similar customer. Um, and it occurred to me that in a given shopping centre, you will have both being present, a nail bar and a hairdresser. But I'm not sure how much they would network with one another to make sure that each other's proposition and each other's clients being exposed to the other. Um, and so that's where I think networking has the potential to be really powerful um, because you can negotiate clipping fees with one another. You can share each other's client information, although make sure you do it in a legal, in a legal way. Um, but, but networking in that context is where I think the real power is. Another example would be, you know, the tourism industry has been the hardest hit. Um, and many small businesses have suffered. Um, you're seeing an emergence, for instance, of pet-friendly bed and breakfast or boutique hotels, um, you know, they should be engaging with the local veterinary practices or veterinary practices in general to say, you know, we've got a destination where you can bring your much loved pets. So I think you've got to look for networks that may not necessarily seem immediately obvious to you, um, but, but have the potential to sort of generate a significant amount of value if you were to sort of collaborate with one another, as opposed to wondering what can you get directly out of that person with whom you're looking to establish um, a network with. So I think, the, and there's also this platforms in which you can go about doing that. I mean, I think we're all very familiar with people, places like LinkedIn, um, uh, and there's many others, again, NetBank, um, and I would encourage anyone on the line to at least, you know, make your own mind up, but go and visit a site called Simply Biz, that's with a Z, dot C, dot Z, A. You know, in that environment, um, you know, we've got, I think at the moment, about 20,000 registered active users. And these are people that have the ability to network with one another and try and find some of the linkages that I've, I've suggested um, where you can genuinely collaborate with one another. We've seen people doing business with one another on that platform. That's, I wouldn't say it's happening in massive volumes, but the, you know, these things start from somewhere. Um, and there's certainly a lot of potential for you to meet a lot of like-minded people. Anybody that goes into that environment is obviously passionate about their own business and interested in understanding how to make it grow. They, 
they wouldn't be going into that environment otherwise. So at least going into that environment, you know you're accessing people that are you know, thinking the same way as you are around their business and how to go about you know, step changing their, their fortunes. So, um, and, and maybe, you know, you'll even find ability to do business with one another. You know, at the top of the pile for most SMEs is, of course, money and, uh, and funding, you know, and there's a lot of uh, disillusioned SMEs around the country and around the world, you know, because they can't get access to funding. Are there funding opportunities available for SMEs, though? Yes, there is. I mean, I think, listen, as a bank, we have to put our hand on our heart and acknowledge that we are, in the traditional banking terms, not great at providing startup funds. In fact, we don't really see that as our core focus or our core job as commercial banks. Um, and that's quite a big acknowledgement, but it's true. Um, our role as a traditional bank is very much around how to get that, how to get that business that has managed to demonstrate a, a, even if it's a short but profitable track record, how do we help them get to the sort of next level? And of course, we've got all the, the traditional funding mechanisms that are available to do that in the form of both short, medium, and long-term type finance uh, products. So, so that as a bank, I think our role is to provide you with the additional working capital um, to help sort of increase your working capital cycle to help you in, sort of cope with the demand in, in what's being asked of your business. <clears throat> I mean, what's happening in that Simply Biz environment I referred to a little earlier is access to a couple of other alternatives. So, you know, crowdfunding, angel, fun angel funding, um, venture capitalism is being positioned within that environment and you can access um, providers of those types of finance through that environment. We also provide um, you with a, what we call a pitch deck, which if, if you're not aware how to put proposals together to those type of funders, then that pitch desk is going to essentially guide you through the process so that you can put a compelling case together to whoever it is you're going to be wanting funding from. So I think that environment, and I just want to emphasize, <clears throat> it's powered by NetBank, but it's not, we don't heavily brand that environment, uh, NetBank. We don't want anybody feeling obliged um, to be with NetBank to be able to access what's available within that environment. Of course, we'd love you to be to be customers of ours, of course. Um, but that's a, a more part of our beyond banking strategy to try and add a bit of extra value. So, you know, apart from the networking bit that we spoke about, there's a lot of information around funding um, and some of the alternatives that I've mentioned there. And then we're seeing those alternative mechanisms gaining momentum. I mean, I think what those alternative mechanisms did provide is that there's definitely a gap in the market between what banks are able to do um, and, and the need to access finance. And so it won't be the answer for everybody, but it'll certainly be the answer for some. And um, encourage you to go into that environment and learn a little bit more. Yeah, Alan, thank you. You know, I know, you know, 10 years ago in our surveys, the biggest demand at that point was for startup funding. Uh, in recent times, now the biggest demand is growth funding, and, and we do know that uh, not just you guys. Most of the funding, the, the commercial banks, you know, are, are really staying away against startup funding and more focusing on the growth funding and, and that type of thing. And uh, there are lots of different models and ways to seek out startup funding, but we do know that's kind of the trend across the board. Alan, as a small business owner. How important is it to ensure cash flow is managed properly and to have oversight of business transactions? And we do know from us by the NSBC, one of the biggest challenge uh, for an SME is, of course, uh, cash flow. If you could just add to that. Yeah, so the cash flow as a banker, um, the cash flow for us is probably the single most important um, element um, for to be managed, at least within a small business. <clears throat> So, and we're not talking about profitability here. We're talking about cash flow in particular, because we've seen um, many a business that can demonstrate um, on their financial statements a profit, but suffer from really bad cash flow. And so, you know, it's a function of the disciplines you have within your business around collecting what's due to you and how you go about paying what's due to others and then what's sitting in your bank account in between. So you know, the most powerful three, cash, powerful three cash flow management documents, I think, are your debtors list, your creditors list and your bank statement. So between those three things, um, it's going to help you understand where you are um, and where you're likely to be from a cash flow perspective. So 
um, for us, it's, it's crucial. There's, there's tools available out there as well to sort of help you manage this if this is an element <clears throat> or an area that you're finding um, challenges with. Um, and as banks, you know, we would ask that you sort of approach your relationship banker direct and they'll sort of help you. And now they're helping you generate cash flow through short term type funding. Um, and they'll do so as long as there's a demonstrable ability to service that cash flow and to ultimately start building up positive cash flow in your new business. And again, I don't mean positive cash balances, I just mean positive cash flow. So what's coming in ultimately needs to exceed what's going out. And if it's not, then you're making then you're running a loss making business. Um, or you're not collecting that damage due to effectively enough. So it's a very critical thing, I think, from, a, from, from our perspective. It's one of the single biggest success factors of, a, of any business out there. Thanks, and a question coming from in the chat from Kukwamba. He's, he's saying that uh, the banks do not provide startup funding. And yeah. I don't answer that. Uh, you're more qualified than I am. Why is that? Well, I mean, so there was an article actually um, circulated. Some of the people in the audience may have seen it yesterday. Just around the significant amount of business failure that exists in the country, and it's mainly a function of startups. So, <clears throat> to give you an example, I mean, banks work on on fairly thin margins. So, we 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 invest, we we take money in and pay people in today's terms, call it four uh, percent. We lend it out, let's say, on average at prime, and that's at seven percent. And so, there's a three percent margin in between. Um, through that, we need to make sure we cover the bad debts, we need to cover the operating costs, and we need to return the shareholders a profit. Now, when you're operating on a margin of, of 3%, and you have a business failure rate in the first couple of years of being in business of, I don't know, that we're generous, let's call it 50%. Um, and if you were to lend to that startup market, the banking industry uh, would have challenges continuing to exist. So it's really a function of the the high failure rates of, of small businesses in this country and picking out the really good ones that when they kick off from the ones that perhaps have a little less or have a lot less hope is in itself a skill that I don't think we as banks, as commercial banks have developed yet. When we do, then we'll become better at providing startup funding. Um, but at this particular point, I don't think it's a competence that is, um, is, well, is well sort of grounded within, within our banking market and any banking market around the world for that matter. And that's why you're seeing the emergence of fintechs and other sort of providers of product capital, because they're working on different margins um, and their ability and they have um, the ability to take on different risks. The other thing is there's regulation in this country uh, with respect to things like the National Credit Act, which does provide limitations on how we as banks may go about um, extending loans. And we have to make sure we do so in what the Act refers to as a responsible way. And that responsible way um, necessitates us to make sure that we can de demonstrate affordability and serviceability of those loans. So there's a few factors that come into it, but the point is absolutely accurate. We're not good at providing startup finance. Um, and there's people like Google Security to provide us, which is not a great, uh, sure. it's not a great for the business. Sure. But Alan, in fairness, you're not a lawyer. You know, it's just it's the way it is. It's, it's, you know. But you know, we've looked at over the last year at the historical uh, uh, ways of doing business where some of the world's mega entrepreneurs, where they had the same question when they started out, they couldn't borrow money to start out. So what they did was, and these are hugely success stories now, is that they started a business that didn't necessarily mean a significant amount of startup funding. Uh, they drove they drove that business hard, they went out there at the cold base, they built their sales, which turned into cash, and then six months later, they had a great start in the banks with funding to the next level of growth funding. So we often urge business owners out there, try and, and, and zero in on a business that doesn't require any or much funding, and then build that into something of sustainability and history, and then you can build your castle. And there are some types of businesses you can't start without funding, like you can't start uh, a furniture manufacturing company with no startup funding or, or those types of business, but as a consultancy or as a kind of business with kind of a bit of equipment, you can get yourself going as a new company and build up that history, and then the banks will love what you do. And I think there's a place for that, and I think that some of the world's top stories have come out of that. But and 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 if anybody out there needs to 
get inside and how to do that. You know, the industry is here to help. You know, we are on a big driver, not only the banks, but like NetBank, we want to cultivate entrepreneurs. And uh, it's the lifeblood of our economy, it's the mainstay of our society, and it's the future of unemployment, alleviating unemployment. So we want to really bring on new entrepreneurs, and we can show ways of how to do that uh, and turn those into mainstream banking clients. But of course, uh, Alan, just another point here, which tools are available to help business owners better manage their cash flow? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's a few, I mean, I think as NetBank, we have a, um, a system, well, first of all, we've struck up a relationship recently, by the way, with a, with a, a, a partnership with a crowd called Zero. Zero is an international um, accounting platform organization. Um, they have some really neat tools. Um, we have recently launched a product which we refer to as, as Money Manager, oh, sorry, Money, Money Tracker. Um, that's a free tool, but unfortunately, it, it pops into NetBank's account system. So um, it's going to be of little value to you unless you are um, a, a NetBank client. Um, so, but again, I mean, the most fundamental form of cash flow management is your creditors list, your debtors list, and your and your bank statement. That's going to put do things very clearly into perspective for you around what your sort of cash flow is going to look like in the in the short term. But I mean, tech's available, and we again we mentioned earlier, embrace it. Um, and those are a couple that you could potentially be making use of. Yeah, yeah, I said right, and you know, getting paid quicker. Uh, you know, there's a there's an art to that, and there's lots of material out there, and. Uh, you know, finding ways to get your invoices paid quickly is an imperative for cash flow. And uh, you, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, advisable. There's lots of tips and tricks and what you need to do to get your supplies to be quicker. But then I'm going to give you one final question. And, uh, you know, it's an obvious question. Uh, what are you guys doing to support small business owners in South Africa? So I think, I mean, we've mentioned a couple of them already. So we've mentioned Avo, and I see there's a comment um, just in the chat bar that it perhaps hasn't been the easiest platform to access. So, um, so, so, so we're doing that. Um, it's a fairly, it's a fairly young uh, development. So, uh, bear with us. We're in the process of sort of signing up merchants at a fairly rapid rate, and it could well be that we're facing capacity concerns or issues around getting you on as quickly and as seamlessly as you'd like. Um, we've also referred to Simply Biz, and Simply Biz we've mentioned as a networking tool. It's a tool in which you can advertise, you can follow blogs, you can add views, you can understand some of the some understand some of the financial or finance alternatives available to you, um, and you can access them through that environment. Um, then there's also, and it's sort of housed within the NetBank site, but again, it's free of charge to anybody who wants to download it. Um, some time ago, we launched what we call the Essentials Guide to Small Business. So I, I do believe it has relevance to any small business, that are irrespective of whether you're starting up or whether you're looking to sort of step change things within your business. It's an easy read. Um, it's downloadable in PDF format. You just go to netbank.coza forward slash small business. You'll see it in the beyond element of the web page. So it's really been a process of trying to provide small businesses with access to information that may be difficult, um, one, to access, um, two, to make sense of, because a lot of these things are, are, are termed and coined in language that you know, makes it seem more complex than perhaps what it needs to be. So I think those are some of the tools specifically, Mike, that um, we've, been, we've been putting out there. There's other parts of our proposition, and I know this is not a net bank punt, but I mean, you know, you can see for yourselves on the netbank.co.za site around how we specifically assist startup businesses with specific offerings that, you know, from a cost point of view, at least are going to help them get a leg up before the business starts taking traction. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a host of things, Mike, but hopefully that sort of gives you some high-level sense as to some of it. True. First of all, Alan, I want to say on behalf of uh, Small Business South Africa, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, you've taken the time out this morning. Uh, we're very grateful for those insights. And uh, as I said before, you know, if we want to take something small away from today and use it uh, to better themselves and their businesses, then uh, we've won. And again, there's a few little bit of echoes and experiences. It's the way life is. We sincerely apologize for that. But uh, Alan, you might have a closing message. No, I mean, just, uh, I don't really have a, haven't prepared a closing message, but just uh, thank you for inviting me into the conversation. Um, if, if anybody would like to reach out um, to me specifically, um, would like some advice, they can, they're very welcome to do so at ashannon.netbank.co.za. Um, 
and uh, just wish everybody the, the very best in, in navigating the really tough space that we're all in. And uh, I hope to be able to join you guys at some point in time in the future, and more importantly, be of assistance to the folk that are that are listening in. Great, thank you, Alan, and to our uh, guests in the house. Uh, we're very grateful, and uh, because of you, we can do what we do, and uh, remain positive, uh, be resilient, stand up, and uh, don't give up. You know, there's great things coming, and uh, all the very best, and uh, see you again next week. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.